We're gonna talk to a congressional candidate out of New York's District 9, uh, Adam Bunkadeco. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, thank you, I appreciate the, the time. Awesome, uh, let's get right into it. For our viewers who may not be familiar with you, why are you running for Congress? Sure, uh, this is my second time running yes. again, and I'm running uh, because we need to go in a different direction in our district. Uh, we've got enormous challenges that we're facing here in central Brooklyn from housing to criminal justice to education uh, to folks just finding an opportunity to make it to get ahead. Folks like my parents who came here as war refugees from Uganda. Uh, and so I was born and raised in this city and this place means so much to me. And I've tried to give back as much as I can. And I think we need to do that in Washington. So let's talk about, you mentioned this is your second time running. The first time it was in 2018, right? It actually was a pretty tight race if uh, I'm not mistaken. Did, what did you like take away from that? What'd you learn from that experience? Uh, I learned that you can survive on very little <laughs> uh, when you're running a campaign. But I think for, for me, what I did learn was that folks are hungry to go in a different direction. Uh, and if we stand up for our values, for our principles, uh, progressive values, our progressive principles, in order to make a difference in our community, I think people will not only uh, be receptive to it, but they will move in a direction that I think a lot of us uh, are hoping to go, not only in this city and in this state, but in this country at large. Let's talk about uh, why you think Yvette Clark needs to be unseated. Sure. Uh, it's pretty simple. I, I've worked in and lived in this uh, my community this in my most of my life, mm -hmm. uh, and Miss Clark hasn't done the things that you expect a member of Congress to do. She hasn't passed any meaningful legislation. Uh, constituent services are a mess. But on the key issue that uh, I brought up during the first campaign, and which I continue to bring up, is housing. Uh, Crown Heights is the epicenter of the nation's housing crisis, and we've got enormous challenges going forward. Uh, rent is escalating uh, above 20% for a lot of folks uh, in our community. And what I'm hoping to propose is what I offered uh, during the last time on the campaign, which is a pathway to ownership for communities of color that are now finding themselves gentrified and displaced in our community. Folks who live in public housing. We have one of the largest proportion of public housing uh, of any congressional district in the country. And so to me, what I think we need to highlight is to not only advocate for the against this administration, which is a total abomination to all of the things that all of us as Americans really believe in, but also for the things that have been going wrong and decaying in our part of central Brooklyn for over two decades now. And that is largely around housing. So uh, the, your race is actually giving a lot of attention, a lot of attention nationally. I've seen a lot of write-ups about uh, your district's race and you're not the only challenger. Sure. Why, what do you say to like voters? Why are you better than the other candidates? Sure, I think for us, uh, look, we've been primarying folks before it became cool. <laughs> uh, and so to me, I think uh, what we need are folks who are gonna go out there and stand up uh, for the values and the issues when, uh, I remember when people came to me and told me, don't do this, this is stupid. Uh, if you want a career in politics, um, this is not the decision to make. And I said, well, what's the point of choosing to go down this road if you aren't gonna stand up for the things that are right? And for me, um, whoever has that message, whoever can build the coalition in our district, which is a very diverse one, uh, it stretches from Park Slope to Brownsville all the way down to Sheepshead Bay. Um, whoever does that will, I think, have the winning message going forward and I believe win this election. I wanna talk about your background a little bit, if that's sure. okay. Uh, and, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but your parents were refugees from Uganda? Yes. Is that correct? Okay, how, how do you think that's influenced your policies? Absolutely, I mean, my dad came to this country in 1980 with $50 in his pocket, clothes he was wearing, extra set in a suitcase. Uh, first place he went to was a detention center over in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Uh. Um, he worked five years, odd jobs, McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts, janitor, security guard, you name it. Uh, my mom lived through a civil war in Uganda. So when people talk about uh, countries mm -hmm. are like our president, uh, that those words are meaningful to not only me, but my family and those in our community who come from the West Indies, from Sub-Saharan Africa. And so the push for uh, immigration uh, reform is not just some talking point to me, 
but it's the mere existence on how I was able to not only grow up here in this city. I grew up in a one bedroom apartment, one of six, attended public schools as a child, was fortunate to get scholarships to go to private school, to Haverford and eventually Harvard. But I've spent my entire life realizing that I'm not, I'm lucky in many ways. And that luck shouldn't be just given to someone with who has chance or who has two parents who are willing to work hard. Uh, I think that should be given to every kid in our community and every person in our country. Uh, And those who are willing to come to this country and willing to sacrifice life and limb to get there ought to have the opportunity to do that. I think it's so fascinating, not fascinating, but I think it's important that you brought up, that you used the phrase immigration reform in this context, because I think so often these days it's used to kind of placate some of uh, Trump's policies. Like, oh, we do need immigration reform. But, and it's like, wait a minute, the reform we need is the total opposite of that. There is no but. Yeah, there is no but. Yeah, and we I actually need me, it to be easier for more people. Yeah, we need to. So, and I, that's why I think this country is great because we allow folks from all across the world to come to this country, from war torn countries like my parents, but also from countries in which um, they're experiencing famine, drought, and the like. And. If we close the doors on that, mm-hmm. then we are becoming something else that isn't American. And that's not the kind of country that we should try to, that we want to live in or should aspire to be in. Um, you know, I think I thought about it when my parents, when my mom uh, talked to me after the election. Uh, and it was a sort of chilling remark in the sense that, you know, she said openly out loud uh, if Donald Trump were elected when we were coming to this country, at um, if we were coming to this country in the 80s, I don't know if we would have come here. And I thought about my entire life and how I've been blessed uh, having grown up in uh, working class communities this whole, uh, in my entire life, that that potentially might not have been the case. And so we really gotta be not, and to your point, I think it's not about immigration reform. It's about what is right, what is fair and what is just. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about some issues that are important to you. Let's talk, uh, maybe we can start with housing as a right. What are sure. uh, the specific housing issues happening in New York and then uh, tell our viewers how you plan to address them? Absolutely. I think you can think about it in three ways. So we've got one, we've got folks of color who historically live in districts that have not, that have been redlined um, during uh, the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So many of the people being displaced right now are folks whose families came here again from the deep south, from the West Indies, and were denied the opportunity to own. And we need to rectify that. We need to allow for folks to be able to own the communities that they help hold together. And so that's why I proposed a Mitchell Lama program, similar to the one we have here in the in the state, in which folks can be able to own cooperatives for middle income and work and low income folks to be able to own the communities that they help hold together. Two is public housing. Again, as was mentioning before, we have one of the largest stocks of public housing of any congressional district in the country. We need to fully fund NYCHA, but we also need to fully fund public authorities, public housing authorities all across this country. Brooke, we have got a issue on public housing. Federal government has been disinvesting in public housing since the 70s, since mm-hmm. Nixon. And that's been Republicans and Democrats who've been signing on to that. And that can no longer hold. I've got folks who live in the Albany houses here in Crown Heights down the street from where I live that have a, they go, if you go inside some of their apartments, they don't even have roofs. They literally have toilet water flowing down from their neighbors from upstairs and holding it together with garbage bags. That's not the country that we should deserve to live in. And that's not the country that we ought to aspire to. And then I think the third is affordable housing. We need to make We need to build more housing in this country. Uh, And the federal government needs to do that. Uh, We can do that through a series of uh, actions, whether it's A, building up the National Housing Trust and actually pouring money as opposed to just only incentivizing developers to build. We need to have the government actually build affordable housing for folks in our community. So on those three fronts, those are the things that I think in central Brooklyn in particular that we need to do. But I think this translates to everyone across this country. If you live in a major metropolitan city in the United States, you probably know someone 
or probably experiencing some issue around housing, in particular rent and gentrification and displacement. And we need, this is a national crisis and a national issue and something that folks in the Congress need to address. What about Medicare for all? Where do you stand on that? Medicare for all, I am for. I believe we need to move toward a single payer system. One, it's far more efficient. We spend roughly 20% of GDP on healthcare. For countries like Germany and Japan, they spend half of that, 10, 8 to 10%. Mm-hmm. They have better outcomes, they have universal coverage, and it's a far more efficient system. So I don't see why we aren't moving toward that immediately. All right, I wish we had much more time, but our time is up. So I just want to make sure that you shout out where everyone can find you, your website. Sure. Your info. Uh, so we're on Twitter, uh, Adam Bunkadeco. Uh, I got uh, our website that's up on 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 there, uh, but this is this is uh, those are many ways for us to get engaged, to stay in, in touch, and to also donate to the campaign. Uh, but I want to say, folks can help out in many ways. They can support either we'll do phone banking for remotely, we'll uh, have folks who give uh, small dollar contributions, but we also are happy to have people come out to Central Brooklyn. Uh, I'll buy you uh, a slice of pizza if you if you're into it. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, Adam. We appreciate the Thank time. Thank you. The TYT Plus app is now available on iOS and Android. Download to get more TYT content at tyt.com/app.